Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this first session of the pre-conference series of the International Humanistic Management Association. We usually hosted a day of a conference before the Academy of Management started. And since this is gonna move into a virtual format, we wanted to host a series, an online series the week before. We're very happy that you can join us. Uh, we're very happy that we have with us David Sloan Wilson and Sigal Barsaid. Sigal, are you there? I think she's on her way to uh, uh, joining. And I'm, um, I'm very excited that we have such an interesting topic that, uh, uh, that we can discuss today from various perspectives scientifically love and organizing what's love got to do with it we know that love is a major phenomenon in public life therefore we have numerous songs pop songs that that have it in their title uh, we hosted a session at the academy of management last year that uh, we named all you need is love this is a follow-up so to speak and we used the different title what's love got to do with it and the question i think is pertinent in what way are we uh, using the concept of love to inform organizing uh, management or business studies. If it's so important in human life, in public life, why is there so little reference to it in the context of business or organization? And with us today, we have David Sloan Wilson, a noted um, and very prominent uh, evolutionary biologist who has been a partner of the International Humanistic Management Association for some time and his work we think fits very neatly in, in helping us to bring about this consilience of knowledge that can form uh, a new paradigm and a humanistic paradigm so to speak and um, we'll get started with David and David um, are you ready to just share some some comments on the notion of love and organizing right now we would have David speak, and then we'll have Sigal join, and then we'll op we're opening up for questions. David, are you? Yep, I'm now unmuted. And uh, uh, Michael, just give me some minutes, a few minutes, uh, because we have so many great people here. I know that we want to move to discussion as soon as possible. So let me just make a, a few comments. Hello, Sigal, there you are. How are you? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Pleased to meet you. This is this very, is the first time. Yes, very nice to meet you. Thank you, Sigal. Well, I I always feel lucky and a bit of an outsider at venues such as this because I'm trained as an evolutionary biologist and I study all things human and that includes business plus so much more. And uh, there's a message even there starting out that I think that we're starting out with a bit of a handicap and that the narratives surrounding business are often uh, make it seem like that it's a different enterprise than other kinds of enterprise. When we say, you know, we're doing business, it's like some kind of different set of rules are, are operating. And that's exacerbated by the entire economic orthodoxy of homo economicus, um, our rational choice theory, greed is good, which is, uh, been so influential in the business world. And in order to recover from that, I think we need to realize that a, a, an organization, especially a business organization, is first and foremost a group of people that are attempting to cooperate with each other, not different from other groups. And it's against that background that when we consider something so, uh, a concept such as love in a broad sense, in all of its usage, then let's start there and then move quickly as to what love means in a business um, context. So love is, in the first place, an emotion. It's an emotional state, but it also leads to action. And if a loving emotional state did not lead to loving action, which is basically acts of giving, uh, then we wouldn't call it love. I mean. It, uh, uh, love has to be, love has to be expressed. And so, what we're talking about is 
a situation in which people are very, very strongly attached, very strong value to what they're doing. And the word love is used in the workplace. Some of us are lucky enough to say that we love our work. And what that means is, is that our work has great meaning for us. And often in common language, we say we love our boss, we love our coworkers. What does that mean? It means that there, there's a wonderful helping relationship that's in place there on some kind of common uh, enterprise. And so I think that the word love fits into a workplace environment just as well as any other environment. And that's, a, I think we've made a big step in, in just making these points, which are somewhat obvious, but uh, still need to be stated. But the next point I want to make, and I'll make it the last point so that we can move briskly along here, is that, of course, love is vulnerable. When we love someone, or when we act in a loving fashion, then we are freely giving of ourselves and giving is inherently vulnerable to taking. And Seagull's colleague at Wharton, Adam Grant, has, says wonderful things about this in his book, Give and, Give and Take, giving, taking, and matching as, as strategies which exist in the business world. And the message of uh, Adam's message is the givers do the best and the worst in the, in the business world. Givers do spec spectacularly well in the business world as long as they surround themselves with other givers. And they fail spectacularly when they're surrounded by takers. It's that simple. And so what this means is, is that in order for love to exist in any context, including a business context, it must be protected. It must be protected against taking and various forms of unloving behavior. And that protection can exist in two forms. A superficial form is that we can find other trustworthy individuals, other loving individuals, and surround ourselves. So that is basically finding um, protection in the character of the people that we associate with. The stronger form of protection is more institutional. In other words, a, a, a group, an organization can have certain rules and procedures and so on, which um, which protect against various forms of exploitative behavior. And in that kind of social environment, the trust is, is a property not of the, of the individuals that you work with, but of the social environment. And that is a stronger form of protection. And much of my work, which I'll, I think we'll be turning back to, so I'll, uh, I'll uh, end up my preliminary comments here, are, are dedicated to showing that the, uh, there's, there are certain design features, and these were articulated by Eleanor Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2009. She articulated certain core design principles that are basically ensure cooperation. And what my research with her and, and beyond has shown is that when business groups are no different than any other kind of group with respect to their need for these core design principles. And in any group, including any business group that implements these core design principles, that creates a trustworthy social environment. It makes giving behaviors of all sorts safe and advantageous. And when people enter that social environment, because they can see that it's safe, they can extend themselves. And that is experienced emotionally as a form of love. So I think that that's probably a good way for me to end my segment of this, and I look forward to what Siegel and then and then uh, all the others have to say. Thank you so much, David. And uh, Siegel, we had some preliminary conversations. You were sort of thinking, like, what does evolutionary biology have to do with this concept? <laughs> and I uh, want to introduce Siegel Barsay to you, and thank you so much, Siegel, for joining. Uh, because you're one of the few, I think, that have used love or the notion of companion love in your academic work. So I thank you, and maybe you can just get us a sense of where you're coming from and what that companion love is and how you might uh, be able to inform or how we might be able to inform our uh, work uh, through the notion of love. So do you want to unmute? You're, you're muted. You're muted. Rookie error. Um, uh, first thing, thank you so much for having me. And it's really, it's um, 
they, David, it's a pleasure to be on this uh, with you because, uh, you know, I, I, I actually um, am familiar with some of your work from an you know, evolutionary uh, perspective, and, and I did say to Michael, like, so how are you? I mean, how are you putting this together? You know, it's so funny. I could have, I, I have my entire intro be um, a conversation with the things that you have just said, actually. Um, and and uh, and and so I'm going to do a little part of that actually, and and so and I'm going to start with the first thing, which is th this idea that that the business this perception, um, not by David, but this perception that business is somehow different from other organizing structures. You know, that's something um, I've spent my career studying emotions in organizations. And the first premise um, uh, scientifically has been that we do not leave our emotions and our personhood at the door of organizations. It's not like we walk into work and say, okay, I am no longer, you know, a person with both cognition and feeling. I only have cognition and that's all I do, right? That's not what we do. We bring our whole selves in and, um, and, and it's funny because this is something that even my doctoral days, I, was was sort of very obvious to me, and um, and I I actually did my early studies of something called emotional contagion, um, which is that we catch emotions from one another um, unconsciously, and um, at the time it was considered to be a very provocative, sort of risky dissertation to do, like you know, the person you're doing emotions and and you know and, and the details of them. And um, and what we what we found was that um, that it was it was really something that um, that made a difference um, in terms. Okay, by the way, I, I hear that the audio is a problem. I've just switched it. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Um, thank you. By the way, the beauty the beauty of chat. And so and and you know there. I, I do think, I mean, definitely within the research community, um, there is no one, um, I, or I shouldn't say no one, but it would be very rare in the field of organizational behavior, um, as well as in organizational psychology, for anyone to at this point have um, so sort of homo rational economicus as our model for what goes on at work. I can't speak to my colleagues in economics departments, but um, but within our field, I mean, it is a you know, the, the affective, I wrote even 15 years ago about the affective revolution and the idea that, um, that, you know, we're the whole person. So I think we've actually had a ton of movement on that within the academy and within, within it, like I said, at least, at least my, my field. And, you know, I would argue that we've also had um, some movement on that, uh, even within the business world. Um, I do a ton of um, sort of exec ed and consulting to really major firms and um, including, you know, like I, I've even, you know, spoken to the military and actually love, by the way, I, I, I have a study uh, with my colleagues, Amy Adler, Paul Bleasy and Walt Soden on um, companionate love in gunnery units. And we show that um, greater um, companionate love like influences cohesion and um, a close cousin optimism literally influences performance resilience. So this has been across domains at this point. And, um, and I, I, so I think we're kind of well on our way to, to better accepting the concept um, of love. Uh, but, but to go to, I think a really important definitional issue is what do we mean by love, or or at least in the the way that I that I study it, and um, and the way that I study love is actually very much based in the psychological literature um, of companionate love, and companionate love um, is the construct of having affection, caring, compassion, and tenderness for you know, another person or the people around you. And this has actually been a fairly long-standing concept 
within psychology. And, you know, I do confess that our, um, my first article, I've done much of this work with uh, Professor Mandy O'Neill, um, and who's also very, very strong in this. And, um, and when we first wrote our, our, our first article, which was uh, titled, What's Love Got to Do With It? Um, uh, a Culture of Companion of Love in Long-Term Care, when we first sent that in for publication, we chickened out in the title and we called it a culture of caring. And we did it because here I'm telling you, well, everybody's over it. But even at the time we were, you know, we were told, well, you know, love, do you want to call this love? And, and, and we were like, all right, you know what? Like nobody's writing about caring either. And in the paper though, you know, we called it, we, 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 we were very clear about what the construct was. And, um, and actually, uh, you know, we often, we often, you know, get upset at our reviewers, but in, in this case, the reviewers were really wonderful because they were like, look, this is love. That's what you should be calling it. And, um, and, and I have to say that, you know, if I, if I, uh, walk myself back a little bit about the openness of all of industry, um, there definitely have been times, uh, where, cause I, when I do this now, I, you know, I call it love. And I remember giving a talk at HBR and I'm like, this is probably the first time love has ever been spoken about in this, con you know, in this room. Um, but so I now really insist on it. And I definitely have had organizations that are like, well, could you call it caring? Could you call it something else? You know, so there are, what one guy said to me, you know, I really, I really would like you to come speak to my company. It was a financial service firm in, in Britain. And he said, but I can't even get my employees to say they love their wives. I, I don't feel like they're going to be able to say that they, they love each other. So, you know, so I'm going to walk back a little bit of my everybody understands love. Um, uh, but, but I am now very clear, though, when I speak about it, that it is companionate love. And from a kind of Greek perspective, it's probably the closest to agape um, if, you're, if you're kind of going that route. And, um, and it's interesting because from an evolutionary biology perspective, um, we, 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 do not, um, we do not put it together with altruism specifically. But, um, um, and in, and in the, our field, altruism is kind of a different construct, but that doesn't mean that altruism couldn't be an outcome variable of companionate love. And, um, and that's another point, um, David, that you made which is that love leads to action. And, um, and that has been really the basis of my research in this field, which is that we look at the outcomes. Now, we, we look at like literally um, sometimes behavioral action. And, and so for example, I have a study in long-term care that, um, that showed that uh, when, when people had uh, companion, a culture of companion love, and I want to, I want to get to that in a minute too. But there was, for example, less absenteeism. So that that's a hard metric, right? That's, and we look at a lot of soft metrics like teamwork, uh, status. So, so for example, David, something that you would predict in this study that Mandy and I, Mandy O'Neill and I did in the long-term care facilities, we found that when you had a culture of companionate love among the staff. Um, that that then led to um, to uh, greater self-reported teamwork, um, greater individual satisfaction, um, and so this is kind of an interesting cross of the individual gene and the. I mean, I'm being metaphoric, but you know, it it wasn't it wasn't just um, you know it wasn't just at the group level. It, it influenced them at the individual level and, and vice versa, including less burnout in a field where there's a lot of burnout. Um, as, as well as, as I said, less absenteeism. But what we also did is we looked at performance and we looked at performance in how the residents were feeling in this long-term care facility. And what we found is of those residents who were able to speak because um, a lot of them had dementia, they reported higher quality of life, more dignity, more satisfaction when they were on units where there was a culture of companionate love among the staff people. So this wasn't how they were behaving toward the residents. This was how they were treating each other. Um, we also found for those who, we, we, we got ratings of mood across everybody and from outside raters, and they found that there was more, um, that there was greater positive mood, even for people who, who ha had Alzheimer's or dementia and you 
who, who couldn't do a self-report. And then finally, we also found that families were more satisfied with um, the unit if there was this culture of companion love. So it rippled out all the way through the community. And, and um, the other thing I want to say here, and again, this, this relates directly, David, to what you're talking about is um, this idea that, um, that love needs to be protected in the environment. And you said, you know, one thing you can do is find, your, find other people around you, and that's one way to protect. And then the other way is institutional with rules and procedures. Well, I think I have um, a combination of those two. Um, which is that most of the work that I have done, in fact, now that I think about it, all the work that I have done on companionate love, and at this point I've done um, quite a bit that's in process and kind of under review as well, um, has been at the culture of companionate love. And the culture of companionate love, it's very similar in terms of its hierarchy to how Shine described um, culture, which is that um, you know you have deep underlying assumptions and norms, deep underlying assumptions and values and norms, but rather than it being what we call cognitive culture, which is what almost the entire field of organizational behavior is focused on, which are how you think about work and I, and ideas and cognitions and how, for example, results orientation or innovation. Um, what what Mandy and I did there, it was the the deep underlying assumptions and values and norms around what emotions are expected to be expressed in that environment or are expressed in that environment, and which you're better off suppressing in that environment. And so this is at a collective level, and the way that we measure it, and this has to do, you know, you said here, love has to be expressed. And what I really like about that is that, um, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to uh, push you on this, I'll be, although I'd be curious to your review. You, you didn't say love has to be felt. You said love has to be expressed. And, um, and I, I assume this also has to do with the action orientation. The way that we operationalize, not just methodologically, but also theoretically, a culture of companionate love is that, you, that people are expressing love. And we will even be kind of provocative and say, you don't necessarily have to feel it. You just have to express it for a culture of love to exist. And, and let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Let's say, um, this is one of my favorite examples, it's tax season, you run a tax firm, and you're number one, and it's three days before all taxes are due. And your number one person comes to you and says, look, I'm sorry, my spouse's family, you know, their, their parent died, I've got to go, I won't be here. And inside what you're feeling at the moment is, oh my God, no, no, no. How about they wait for the funeral for a little bit? Um, or were you really that close to your in-laws? <laughs> you know, Like, like do, you, do you really have to go? I mean, that's what you're feeling inside, but you kind of get it together and you're like, I got it. Of course, you go do what you need to do. We will handle things here. And what happens is that when you do that and you express that love, then first thing the other person is like, yeah, that's our rules and norms and, and they also feel value. But the other thing that we, we say is that um, one of the mechanisms, we say there are two mechanisms through which a culture of love gets transferred. Um, the first one is emotional contagion, which I mentioned before. So if I express love, then you're going to catch that and you're going to express love. The second one are normative enactments, meaning I'm expected to show love. And so because of that, I'm going to show love. And we have some really interesting quotes from like one nurse who said, you know, if you're, um, uh, if you're just not as loving, you, you just become loving when you're around here. And so the idea here is that the institutional logic is not about rules and procedures in culture. Culture is an unwritten thing, actually. It's everything that's not rules and procedures. But it is more, I would argue, even more powerful than that, which is it is the norms and values that are expected to be enacted in your environment. And one last thing I'll say about that, and then I'll stop, even though I have a couple other things that David said, but I want to give a chance to respond. 
The, the one thing I do want to say here, though, is a couple of things. One is that um, even though it is not the rules and procedures, um, I do a lot of work in culture in general. Culture is much more powerful when it is in alignment with a firm strategy and its structure. And David, I think that structure piece was the rules and procedures piece. So if you have things in place in the organization that help support the culture of companionate love. So if you have things like um, uh, a colleague of mine actually just did this and said, you know, no emails this weekend, um, or, or it could be even the way you pay people, but things that support the caring, compassion, affection, and tenderness, I completely agree with you. That is going to be much, much more protective. And the other last thing I want to say is that even though I said that you don't have to feel the love, one of the things we argue is that because of contagion, including self-contagion, and because of the act of love, very often people will start to feel it. It will be a reciprocal cycle. So with that, let me stop and uh, let you take it away. Thank you so much, Sigal. Very rich. And uh, David, uh, you you want to respond? So, so I do. I'm going to take my prerogative here, responding, and then we'll open it up. But uh, uh, so great, uh, Sigal. I want to affirm just about everything that you uh, uh, that you said, starting with culture <laughs> and the importance of culture as something that's different than institutions and and uh, rules. So uh, I just finished a conversation uh, with. Uh, to uh, uh, Norwegian colleagues about Norwegian culture and the entire Nordic model. Why is it that the Nordic countries do so well in so many respects, economically, happiness, every, every positive metric, the Nordic countries are scoring near the top. And Nina Vitacek, one of my, uh, the friends with whom I was having this conversation, uh, uh, very much emphasized the idea of, of culture as distinct from institutions and organizations. She was criticizing a book such as Why Nations Fail, which is as far as it goes, um, about variation in the quality of, uh, and the efficacy of, uh, of, um, of uh, nations as uh, just I mean, the entire field of political science relying too much on organizations as opposed to cultures which are much more organic, they're transmitted from generation to generation, often through stories and narratives and national heroes and, and practices such as the custom of Dugnad, which is a, uh, a basically reinforcing cooperation. So, so um, I agree with you totally, Cyril, about, about uh, the culture and never meant to apply, imply uh, otherwise. I'd also like to make a point about scale independence. The fact that we can be talking this way about a single organization, even a small one, or a large one, a major corporation, or a nation. And while we're at it, let's go all the way up to the whole earth. So these ideas are scale independent, and that is a priceless insight you know, to have a set of ideas which can actually be used to, to improve the functioning of uh, small groups, such as any small business, all the way up to the to the global um, global um, uh, scale. On love felt and and uh, and expressed, also I want to uh, um, affirm that. And I think that uh, evolution really has a contribution to make here, modern evolution, in in really taking cultural evolution seriously, and also the importance of symbolic thought. Symbolic thought is distinctively, maybe even uniquely human. Why is that? It's because it's a form of cooperation. It's a form of mental cooperation. You cannot maintain an inventory of symbols with shared meanings without a high degree of cooperation and, uh, and trust. And so once we had the capacity for symbolic thought, that became a full-blown inheritance system, like the genetic inheritance system. But of course, so much faster. And so as soon as we begin to think about our symbolic systems as like our genotypes, like our genotypes, then we realize that in order to the relationship that, that there's a inextricable relationship between our inner lives and our outer lives. The way we think about things is what leads to action. And so therefore we must work on the way we think about things in addition to um, to 
how we behave. And there's a feedback relationship, which Siegel, you also uh, mentioned. I'm reminded when I was studying religion as my main topic, I, w I learned that Judaism is a kind of special this way, and that uh, this Judaism is, is pretty forgiving of, of non-belief. You can, I, I was told that you can go to your rabbi and you could say, Rabbi, I just cannot believe in a higher power. The rabbi says, well, don't worry. Practice. And actually, it might come to you. So that feedback between, between practice and, and behavior, I think is, uh, and when we work with groups ourselves, Siegel, I'd love to compare notes with you and everyone else on, you know, how do we actually work with groups? We borrowed techniques from mindfulness-based therapy. And the way that works, basically, we begin with our values. We're a group, it could be a business group, any other kind of group. Why is it important to us? What values does it represent? So you work on the values component, that's inner. And then immediately you ask the question, well, well, how would we behave on the basis of these values? Can you achieve a consensus around that? What are the behaviors that will actually take us towards our valued goals? Then you hop back into the mind and you say, well, what are some of the mental obstacles that get in the way of this? And so many of us as individuals and even more as groups, we have these, you know, this, these things that hook us and that cause us to do things that are counterproductive, take us away from our valued goals, and so on and so forth. So basically, it's a dialectic between inner and outer. And that has to, and it's, and it's all based on aligning practice with value. So I think that some version of that, and some version of that has been invented again and again. That's another point I want to make. The, the management field is so sprawling that just as Eleanor Ostr or powerful research groups look at any kind of group, including management methods, you find a bell-shaped curve. You find that they vary in how well they work from the best to the worst. And the best have converged upon best practices and best uh, principles. And really the, the advance is to unify those, to really have some stronger scientific and theoretical sense of what works and doesn't work so that we can go beyond somewhat encapsulated change methods that, uh, that, are, that do work but are quite local in their expression. So much more to say, but I'm gonna end actually, uh, Siegel, when you mentioned the military, I think that's such a fascinating example because on the one hand, you think uh, uh, you know, fighting is the farthest away from love, but of course that's not true at all. And that, uh, and that talk to any soldier, and my father among them, who described his wartime experience as both the worst time of his life and the best time of his life. And the best time of his life was the bond that he felt, the band of brothers that he felt with his fighting uh, 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 partners. And I do want to say one more thing, I'll be as quick as I can, but it's so important because the greatest culprit, I think, impediment to our thinking is individualism. And homo economicus and all that stuff, that's just a version of, of individualism. Individualism is something that took over the, our entire culture for the last 70 years. We now have the axiomatic assumption that everything social must be understood in terms of individual thought and action. And that is the most profound change, I think, of evolutionary thinking is to, is, to, um, is to replace individualism with a view in which the small group doing purposeful things is the fundamental unit, not the individual. Individuals were never alone. Throughout our history, we lived in small and for the most part, highly cooperative groups looking out for each other's survival and reproduction. And so that is the natural human social environment which manifests itself in military groups that are working together in, in literally life and death situations. And so absorbing that message is that really what we need to do is we need to build groups at all scales, but the small group, the real missing link, as you know if you've read books such as, such as Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam, doing things in groups is used to be 
just come naturally. But during the last half century, it is it is dissipated to the point that that uh, that needs to be a recreation of uh, of society. Okay, so now I am going to yield to others. Sigal, <laughs> do you want to respond? I I also just want to throw in the question that in the very beginning is uh, this the system and, or the language that we're using and Sigal you're referring to that again we, we don't use the term love we sort of hide in terms of caring compassion now is sort of acceptable pro sociality and so it's like hmm okay so we're getting at the same thing but somehow we're still hiding so i'm wondering what the symbolic system is that we're inheriting or that we're giving and passing along uh, i don't know maybe if you want to respond or uh, uh, Sigal Sure. So, um, so, you know, what I, well, actually, it's really interesting because there's a wonderful compassion literature um, that the positive organizational psychology folks have, has, has done. And, um, and, you know, and it's funny when we, when we did this, when we talked about this construct initially, um, it was actually, even though we called it caring, it was very important for us to actually go broader than that because compassion um, co compassion is a kind of a very specific construct, and um, and if you think about, um, for those of you who are familiar with Phil Shaver's work in psychology, where he has a prototype model of emotion, and he's got kind of the major five prototypes, um, love is the overall prototype with kind of compassion underneath it. And so, um, so for kind of exactness purposes, we we really wanted sort of the bigger construct but of course it goes back to that um almost more um political uh kind of feeling of like well can you you know can you even say love and that's why one of the things that you know david you you mentioned the you know my my study with the army and the army and and a couple of the the uh, comments have mentioned about that too is you know when when um i approached my my colleagues there um uh you know they they were like oh no this is obvious that we have love in the military like like that is that you know it was not shocking there was one interesting thing though um from a uh, measurement perspective which was that um that when we gave the scale of affection caring compassion and tenderness it's actually by the way anybody who's doing this in organizations or who's a scholar like this is not a, a hard scale. I mean, it is literally, you know, to, to what degree do other people in your work environment express the following emotions and those four items, um, and, and it predicts phenomenally well. Um, but, but the one item in the military context that did not hold together as well in reliability or the factor analysis was actually tenderness, which is interesting. So affection, caring, and compassion, yes. Tenderness, not so much. And that also gets me to um, a, a small point I wanna make about measurement. Because I think that measurement, I think part of the th reason that people resist love and even emotions in general in organization, including some scientists is like, well, how do you measure this, right? And, um, and again, there are different measures and it's funny because um, I tie, probably for, for no good reason, but when I tend to think about kind of evolutionary biology, I tend, uh, when I'm not thinking about small, you know, protozoa or something, I tend to tie it more to, um, if there was a measure, it, I tend to tie it more to the anthropological side of things, which is kind of deep ethnography. Um, and that could be actually, and David, that could be completely wrong. So, because not to bore people, but, but, there used to be in the 80s, there was a very big debate in the culture literature um, because culture was really owned by anthropologists. And anthropologists believed that it was near, near heresy um, to try to quantify empirically, you know, with numbers, a culture. What you needed to do is you need to go in, you need to do an ethnography, you needed to let it build, you needed to be organic. And I think that work is tremendously useful and I don't have any problem with it. I don't see it as an either or, I see it as an and. Um, but, but we, um, but my technique and I, I was, I was, you know, my approach is more quantitative. And so a, a question I often get, um, is, well, how in the heck do you measure emotions, right? Like, how would you even like measure love? And, um, and in that first study 
we use that as a place to really establish the construct of validity. And we had three different types of measurements. The first measurement, and the one that I think probably was the most convincing to, to, to people, was that we had um, observers on the unit who regularly observed the staff interacting with one another and then rated them on a scale on these four dimensions, but they were observers. Then what we had is we had um, the, the staff themselves rate, but again, we, we didn't ask how they felt. This isn't a group of, I do a lot of work in group emotion in general. This is not a group emotion measure. This is not, a, this is not an aggregation of how people feel. This is their view of what they see around them. So they're serving as informants in essence. And then finally, we also looked at cultural artifacts. Um, so what were things on the unit that indicated love? You know, pictures of people's families, are they celebrating birthdays? Are they helping them each other out with coffee? You know, things like that. And so, um, so that's how we went about measuring this construct initially. Um, now, when you're in organizations, you can't always have a, you know, um, a, an observer on the unit and you can't always be able to go in and look for cultural artifacts, but you can almost always be able to get people to fill out a form in a very short form describing their environment. And because of our first study, we know it correlates with all those other things and it really helped to, um, to, to establish the construct. And so, um, so, there are, so basically there's lots of different ways to measure emotions, including love, but, but again, I really like, as it relates to at least a culture of love, the expression part is key for me. I also do want to address one question um, in, the, in the chat, which was Gareth Craze's question, um, which was, um, do you think that building institutions to promote companion and love in the workplace could work as a form of long-term emotional counter contagion or a positive contagion spiral against the contagious nature of workplace depression. And the reason I, I really like that question and wanted particularly to address it is that um, I have a study with Mandy O'Neill and another colleague, Francesco Seguera, that we did um, uh, in a hospital. And we looked at all the units across the hospital at the culture of love on the unit. And in this case, what we found and predicted and found was that a culture of companionate love could serve as a buffer. In this case, it wasn't a culture of depression, but it was a culture of anxiety. And what we found was that there was an interaction effect, which is that when you had um, a strong culture of anxiety and a weak culture of companionate love, you had more burnout, less satisfaction, and less psychological safety. Um, but if you had a strong culture of anxiety and a strong culture of companionate love, that effect went away. So you, you, you didn't have the same, you have less burnout, more psychological safety, and more satisfaction. And that what a culture of companionate love does, we posit, is that it serves as this buffer, because we can be anxious for many things about many things. This also happened to be a hospital that was like one of the lowest performing hospitals in the country, and so there was there was a lot of anxiety among the um, among the employees. But if they were if they were cocooned by being surrounded by a culture of people who, with whom they shared companionate love, it was powerful enough to put them in a position, I'm sorry, I should be clear, they had the same level of psychological safety and, and um, burnout um, as did people who were in units of, lo of lower anxiety. So it literally brought them down to the same level as people with lower anxiety. And the other thing that's very cool about this study, and this is one of the first studies that is shown in general that culture can influence financials, we showed that the same effect occurs with costs. So on units in which there was a, a strong culture of companionate love um, and a strong culture of anxiety, they had costs at the same level as units with low culture of anxiety. And the worst was if you were a strong culture of anxiety and a, and a weak culture of companionate love. 
So, um, and this is literally, like I said, this is literally on cost variables. And our whole point in that study though was the interaction effect, was the protective effect of a culture of companion and love. So not only does this have its own main effects, but it can, per, per Gareth's intuition, it can actually um, help to ameliorate other negative parts or facets of the culture. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I, I want to open it up to some of the questions that are posed. And, and, and maybe, Gareth, uh, are you, do you want to do a follow-up? Are you there? Can you unmute? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, can you, help? Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the only follow-up I want to say is that I just uh, defended my dissertation. I, uh, I used Seagal's work, I cited Seagal's work fairly extensively in, um, in my dissertation work. Um, so I just wanted to give you a shout out for inspiring my work as an aspiring scholar. Um, but no, you, you, you pretty much, uh, you captured my intuition with your response. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I fully see, you know, the instituting of companionate love as just being, you know, to, to the point you made about the study you've already conducted, you know, perhaps extending that to the realm of workplace depression, I think this really is going to be this, the antidote to this like un, unyielding malaise that we see that we haven't quite seemed to figure out. So um, all hands on deck and companionate love seems like a very, uh, very powerful force against uh, workplace depression. So thank you, Sigal, for that, for that answer. Well, and Gareth, I'm so excited that you used it. And, and, and I, I have, a, it's, it's funny. I, I, so just from a career perspective, um, generally in, in, in my career, what I've done is I've kind of gone into an area, I've done a study, and then I've gone to a different area and done a different study because I get, basically I just get restless. And so I haven't, I, I've, I've never really like, for example, my work on emotional contagion, it's not like I did six follow-up studies on emotional contagion. You know, I went in and I then did other things and affective diversity and I, you know, and the one domain that has kind of caught me is in, in general emotional culture and specifically companionate love, culture of companionate love. And the reason is it just predicts so phenomenally well. I mean, it is so powerful and, and actually um, cl a little closer to depression, uh, Gareth, uh, I have a study with um, Hakan Ocelik on loneliness um, at work, and we show that um, that when you are lonelier at work, um, your work performance is significantly less. It's significantly lower, and it's a very powerful effect, actually. But one of the things we find as a moderator, so this is again, this is getting one step closer to depression. We find as a moderator that if you have a stronger culture of companionate love then one aspect of this effect becomes weaker, which is, which is um, people who are lonely don't get as um, unattached to their organization as if you have a weak culture of companionate love. And so, so we are already starting to show, again, in this interaction effect. So there's a main effect of companionate love on all sorts of things, but there's also this interaction effect of companionate love, which again is serving as this buffer against the negative things. And David, I think that that would relate from your perspective as well, right? That companionate love in its own right is not just something you, that, that um, a group or, or organism uses to build things, but also just in its protective capacity. Is, is there any work on that from a kind of evolutionary biology perspective? Yeah, sure there is. And uh, as you were talking about this protective factor, I was thinking about which I think is going to be a closely related construct, which is which is flexibility. And uh, there's a lot of literature on showing that, uh, first of all, people and organizations vary in their ability to moderate stress. So basically, if you have stress, anxiety, if you're in a stressful situation, and if you're not flexible, then uh, that leads to various dysfunctions, such as mental illness and so on. If you're flexible, then that moderates stress. You haven't, you haven't eliminated stress, but uh, what you have is you've um, eliminated or moderated its negative effects. And a plus for this 
is adaptability. Flexibility is basically that under stress, you process it in a way that causes you to do new things, basically, that are more adaptive. And so this, this uh, and we haven't really been talking about flexibility or adaptability, which every organization needs. I'm shocked. I'm just a kind of amateur. We're reading the management literature, but from what I've read, um, uh, including the work of uh, Charles uh, uh, O'Reilly, I mean, most organizations, even the ones that are currently thriving and doing what they do well, are so bad at change and they, they go under. I mean, creative destruction is typically the way that change happens. The number of businesses that actually are adaptable and are still standing after even you know 20 or 30 years is a very small fraction. So isn't it great that while we're talking about all these great um, um, manifestations of uh, love and compassion, we could add adaptability to that list. Actually, it's interesting. So as I mentioned, I do a lot of work on culture in general and, um, and with companies. And when I list out um, kind of the set of cultural values, I include, because I also look at cognitive values, um, innovation is reliably, absolutely reliably last. And in fact, uh, you know, I, 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 I've been thinking about writing an article saying, you know, the, the innovation no one wants, really. Um, and actually, there's been some some work on that done by um, by Jennifer Mueller. Um, you know that that we say we want innovation, but when it when it comes down to it, we're very um, we're very distrustful of. Um, and there's another study on this recently. We're very distrustful of innovative uh, people. Um, we think they're flaky and they can't be trusted to, you know, take the helm. And that could influence that as well. Interesting. Matt Lee, are you there? Can you ask your question, maybe even connected to Sherazad, who had to leave? Matt? Yes, yep. certainly. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, everyone. Really um, wonderful conversation. Um, so this is, is maybe a way to broaden it. And so, um, yes, to, to the point that uh, Sherazad made, uh, which I think at one point David's remarks did affirm, um, we can look at the dimension of love that Sorokin called extensity and argue that a deeply extensive love is preferable to the limited understandings of love that do seem indeed to prevail in our culture, focused on the near and dear, focused on the in-group, often focused on just people. Extensive love would promote an awareness of the sacred, and I emphasize that word, sacred inherent worth of all life, including all people without exception. This is uh, a foundation for a culture of love that would be more effective in producing more good outcomes, more flourishing for all without exceeding the ecological clearing capacity of the larger environment. This is more healthy and mature. And uh, Jim Ritchie Dunham is on the call today and his research on the science of abundance moves us in the direction of this wider extensity by showing the value of attending to all levels of relationship simultaneously. This is really important, I think, and his work shows this. How do I relate to myself? How do I relate to others and to groups? How do I relate to nature? And how do I relate to spirit? Deep relations at all five levels is ideal. And so oftentimes we're only aware of and attending to one or two of these types of relationships. We forget about the self, we forget about nature, we forget about spirit in our focus on interpersonal um, relationships. So anyway, I'll, I'll leave the comment at that, but I think there is a lot of value in moving us towards broader awareness, broader extensity, and attending to all five of these relationships. <laughs> so Siegel, would you like to comment on that before, uh, before I do? Um, I, I follow behavior and I noticed that you unmuted way before me. So I'm going to let you speak first and I'll take it. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not enough for us just to talk about love. We have to talk about spirituality too, um, to further alienate ourselves from some segment of the management community. But uh, uh, what you said is so important. Uh, and um, gosh, where to... Uh, 
uh, where to begin? I mean, one way to begin, and this is very much a, an implication of multi-level selection theory, is that uh, is that uh, cooperation at any scale becomes selfishness at higher scales. If I'm a selfish individual, that's bad for the group. If, if, if we're in a highly cooperative group, that group can do harm to other groups. If we're a nation that's growing our economy, well, that can lead to global climate change. And the only solution to that problem is to have a whole earth focus. So really this must begin with a whole earth ethic. That's point one, but that's not good enough because that whole earth ethic must be then expressed appropriately expressed at all of the intermediate layers, all of the institutions, all the way down to uh, the most local of groups, which is psychologically the most salient. So on the one hand, it has to be a whole earth ethic, but on the other hand, it has to be densely cellular at the level of small, uh, uh, small groups. And then the spiritual dimension um, is just huge. Let me just affirm that. And we're actually doing research on this. And, and I'd love to involve others in this research. When we work with groups, we have a mindfulness-based component, which actually is a scientific form of, of uh, spirituality as far as it goes. Then we, we coach on the uh, Ostrom Core Design Principles. That's social organizational. Uh, in addition, we're beginning to coach on, on, on spiritual uh, principles as well. There's a number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, universal spiritual um, uh, principles that can be coached and with practices and, and so on. And when you look at spirituality in its most general form, then what it does is it cultivates a state of mind that, that leads to selfless service basically when you regard something as sacred you're placing it above you you're saying there, there's something out there that's more important than my concerns i'm going to dedicate myself to that thing and that thing might be the purpose of the group and of course to serve a wider purpose so to have a strong sense of a spiritual access to to a group i just go such a long way in resolving potential conflicts between the individual and the group. That's what it's all about. That's why it exists. That's why it evolved, to, that we have this spiritual sense. And so we should be, we should be uh, uh, making the most of that and experimenting with it uh, as much as possible. And my, um, my response is, I, I think it's fascinating. And I think, um, I think that that you know broadening this construct um, uh, it could lead to some really really interesting things in terms of um, kind of where it's coming from. I I think that from an organizational perspective, um, the the one place I could see it um, playing in at least today is so. So at this point, I've done a tremendous amount of work looking, or not tremendous, but it, it, more than I usually do, looking at the um, outcomes of companionate love, either as a direct main effect or as an interaction effect. And, and a lot of that has been just to see, does this influence um, organizational life? I mean, you know, so much of the initial resistance would be, well, it doesn't matter, which of course, surprised that like, like, I'm like, how, how could anybody be surprised that a culture of companion love is going to lead to, you know, better teamwork and more psychological safety more? I mean, it just seems so obvious. Like this does not seem like a kind of a groundbreaking thing, but you need to sort of prove that no, no, love has these, you know, practical organizational effects. But one thing that because of that, we haven't done as much in the research literature, and I would really encourage other people to do is looking at the antecedents of companionate love. So what is it, how, how, how does companionate love occur? Again, I'm speaking about groups and organizations. How does companionate love occur in an organization? And when I do this work, when I sort of hand wave at it, I go, I go to the culture literature, um, which as you mentioned, by the way, David, you know, that's you know, really some of the people who are, who are just so core in the culture literature, like, like Charles O'Reilly, who, by the way, I'll note was one of my mentors in graduate school. Um, so he, he's awesome. And, um, and Jenny Chapman, 
uh, who, who I've also done, done work with and, and is a mentor. Um, and you also mentioned Michelle Gelfand, who is, who is wonderful. And, and, you know, we have, we have, we have, um, more antecedents, um, I think on the cognitive culture side, but on the emotional culture side, um, you know, if you even borrow from that literature, it's mainly the behavior of the leader. And this also relates to some of the questions that were there, which is how do you do this in an organization? Um, much of, um, because of the structures and norms and rules in an organization and the leader tends to have their hand on that, right? The leader decides, well, what are we reinforcing? The leader decides what is our strategy. Much of the way culture gets transferred is through the leader. But that doesn't mean that it can't get transferred in the other direction as well. And actually one of my doctoral students, uh, Constantinos Kodafaris, has been always big on, well, can't we go in the other direction? And it makes me wonder if this concept of, um, of uh, extensicity, or I, I'm not even sure if I'm saying it right, but this idea that you can have love at all these different dimensions, well, the more that you have of that, the more likely you are to have companionate love within this one construct, or one, um, one situation. So I think that's a really interesting way in with that and um, both from a research perspective and a practical uh, perspective. Yeah, if I might yeah, have my prerogative again, because this is so stimulating, I don't want to talk too much, but there's two key points I want to make before we're done. We still have half an hour, but I'll make them now. They're both so key. One has to do with leadership. And leadership is such a huge topic in the management uh, uh, literature. And I mean, the very word has a, autocratic nature that implies an imbalance of power. And yet an imbalance of power is a great inhibitor of love. In a loving relationship, there is more equality in a loving relationship than an autocratic relationship. There's a huge, huge literature on you know types of, of, of leadership and organization. And, and in, in most cases, uh, autocracy, uh, unbalanced, uh, 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 power is toxic to a cooperative organization. Leadership is important, structure is important, but it also must be accountable. The good leader is the one that's the good moderator, that, that, that earns his leadership from a good reputation. And if he doesn't deserve a good reputation, then he he's doesn't no longer becomes a leader and so on and so forth. And so there's, an, a, there's a kind of egalitarianism to love and compassion that needs to be reflected in the organization. And that includes the culture plus the rules, back to our earlier themes. So there has to be a kind of a bottom-up control of leadership, in addition to the very nature of top-down uh, leadership. So there's a huge piece about leadership that we have to be thinking about in relation to Love. And the second point I wanted to make, it's a different point, has to do with the diversity. We need to expect a certain kind of cultural diversity in how love is manifested. And here I think evolution once again becomes important. If you do an experiment, and this experiment has been done, where you create a whole bunch of different populations, isolated populations, and you select for the exact same traits, phenotypic traits. What you find is, is that every population responds to selection, so they all evolve that trait, but how they do it, the mutations that evolved were different because mutations are chance events and so on and so forth. So there's a many to one relationship between the, the, uh, the outward form of the organism and the mechanisms that cause that, and, uh, this is the difference between proximate and ultimate causation. When you transfer this to cultures, what you find is, is that most enduring cultures um, are pro-social. I mean, they function well as cultures, otherwise they wouldn't be enduring. But if you look at the specific mechanisms as to that cause people to do the right thing and in the right context in those cultures, you find that those mechanisms can be very different from each other. Uh, and we can make that point with uh, the great religions that compare even 
Christianity with Judaism, not to speak of Buddhism, Confucianism, all of these are systems which provide moral systems, which provide a kind of a social blue, but do so in different ways, do so in different ways. In the military, we have love in the military. In some cultures, there's a big sexual dimension to that. Homosexual behavior is normative throughout history in many military cultures, but in other cultures, it's prohibited. And there's love, but it's not sexual love, or at least that's counter-normative rather than, rather than uh, normative. And so we should expect when we encounter, and, and everything I've said at a large scale shrinks down to the scale of single organizations, especially when we put in cultural variations. So, you know, Chinese corporations versus American corporations and so on and so on and so forth. So what this means is, is that although there will be a strong connection between the inner and the outer, always, that inner is going to be variable. And we better know that because if we don't actually know the mechanisms that are resulting in the expression of pro-social behaviors, then we will likely interfere with them. So this kind of diversity, I think, was inherent in the, in the distinction between proximate and ultimate uh, causation, if you've become familiar with evolutionary terms, is uh, very, very important for us to keep in mind. Um, you know, I want to, it's interesting, I want to, I want to address the leadership point that you made. So, um, so one of the studies that um, is near and dear to my heart that, that uh, we've actually collected data for and we're now writing up, this is a study uh, that I did with um, the Constantinos, who I mentioned before, and Jacob Levitt, another doctoral student of mine, um, has to do with um, the emotional culture of leaders in sport on sports teams. Um, because sports teams are one of the few places left where um, coaches in the form of leaders are really willing to say, like, you know, I, I'm going to, you know, sort of I'm going to behave in angry, upset ways with you to get you to perform well. You know, if I, you know, kind of the tough love and, and I'm going to make things really hard for you and that's how you're going to perform. And, um, and having kids who had played in sports, I just was like, I, I was like, I just think that, that these coaches are going about this completely the wrong way. They're causing so much anxiety in these, and I'm thinking more of like, sort of college level and down sports, they're causing so much anxiety in these, in these players and they could get so much more out of them if they actually behaved in loving ways rather than in angry, punitive, fearful ways. So we did a very elaborative, uh, elaborate study with um, the entire sports program of a Mid-Atlantic University. Um, so all of, all of their teams and we, um, and we uh, surveyed them in four periods of time, preseason, um, uh, two times in preseason, the competitive season, postseason. Uh, it is it's something like 900 athletes and 300 coaches. I mean, so it's, it's a huge amount of data. And our hypothesis was that coaches who are enacting a culture of companionate love will have, um, their, their, their uh, athletes will perform better. I mean, in addition, they will also be happier, they'll be more psychological safety, all the kind of soft metrics, but that they will literally perform better. And this is what we found. So we found that if we compared love versus fear or anger, that both at the individual level of performance, as well as even the collective level of performance, teams and, and athletes performed better. So, um, and, and what, um, and again, for me, this is like, well, this seems kind of obvious, but I'm hoping that maybe this will change something in, in, in their world, but also from a broader organizational perspective that, that this was, um, that, that this is a signal to leaders that if you behave in a way that has more affection, caring, compassion, and tenderness for your people, they will perform better, which is one of the things that you want. And I wonder, David, I mean, I, I don't find um, the, the term um, leader as, um, as, as uh, noxious, uh, perhaps, from the hierarchical perspective, particularly after seeing lots of leaderless teams flail about. 
But I wonder if the companionate love that leaders are showing in essence is, is reducing the kind of negativity part and this, the social structure part that you, that the, the negative part of that that you're talking about. So that if a leader is, in, in, is, is showing true care and compassion, and by the way, we looked at mediators and the mediators that we found were people felt valued. Um, they, that was actually the prime mediator, the people felt valued, but also that they felt they trusted the coach more and that they believed in the coach more and there was more of a relationship. So I wonder if that is serving the role um, that, that in essence reduces the hierarchy because of the caring, but has the benefit of keeping the hierarchy in the sense of organizational structure. So I'm curious about your view on that. Well, in the let, first... me, let me maybe come in with another question by Charlene Sitzma. Maybe we can connect this because it's sort sure. of the application of this. Charlene, are you there? I am, yes, thank you. Yeah, I was uh, very interested in this talk and thank you, Seagal and David, very much for uh, uh, presenting this. It's really encouraging. Um, one of the things I'd love to see is, uh, you know, we're all leaders as well in the classroom and we uh, can show our leadership by trying to build a, a, a culture of companionate love. Um, and, you know, personally, I teach a lot of very experiential kinds of courses and uh, students have to try things out and fail. And uh, so I try to work to um, have them consider it like a collaboratory. We're all caring about each other, giving each other good developmental feedback. And uh, as a result, we're willing to try different things. Um, but I have hesitated to use the word love. I've, I've used it, but I've hesitated because of the whole MBA toughness, competitiveness kind of thing. And I'm just wondering um, how other people do it. How do you build a culture of love in the classroom? Thanks. I, um, so you're, all, you're muted. Actually, what I was going to say is that this is a this is actually a wonderful time. Um, I mean, I'm happy to answer, but this is a wonderful time to turn to um, some of the folks uh, who are on this call because if you've had any experience with trying to build that affection, care, compassion, and tenderness, and so that I don't uh, so I don't accidentally cold call on people, I, I will say one thing, which is, um, I. So it's funny, you know, I've talked a lot about the expression aspect of love, but um, in, in one of the things we know from the emotional regulation literature is the concept of deep acting and surface acting. And, you know, surface acting is have a nice day and deep acting is you really actually feel the emotion. And so, um, you know, I, there was a time where um, particularly um, earlier on in my career, that, that I was struggling a little bit more with, with kind of um, the skepticism about my field, right? So, so this was, uh, you know, th this really was much earlier, I mean, it was like 20 years ago, but, but, you know, and there was even less kind of support for this kind of stuff. And I felt like my, particularly my MBA students were like, ah, what is this about? And that kind of gets you in this adversarial relationship. And I just, I, I actually got myself into this point where I was like, you know what? I really care about these people. I really care about them. I want them. And, and actually the way that I feel like I have impact in the world is by the creation of knowledge. Again, this is not going to be profound, but by the creation of knowledge and the dissemination of knowledge. And it's all the students I teach who then go out and they're in organizations and they're the ones who are going to make a difference. And I really got myself to a place where I was like, I really, I really had compassion for these people. I cared for them. And that, that even if they were not, um, you know, immediately on board with things, I could feel like, like I wanted to do this and that deep acting. And then that led me to enact the love part of it. Um, and so, you know, so that, that has been, you know, one technique, but I also, I, I really think it is about the, the going back to that leadership piece that it's this, it's this showing of the affection and the caring, which, which also has, as is one of its outcomes, respect. And, People really, uh, you know, people really um, are attuned to this authenticity. I mean, I have a study with Nancy Rothbard and Tim Kundro that we find that people who are um, emotionally and cognitively transparent 
do better, including in the sales setting. And so, um, so I, I, you know, I kind of had to get myself there to then be able to express it. But I'm curious really about other people, you know, in the classroom and what, what they've done in that context. I want to a um, bit more on leadership, and this is going to be applied to the classroom as uh, as much as any. I think it takes us back to the beginning of this conversation, where we we say, you know, trust can come from working with a trustworthy individual, or it can come, be more structural. And I think uh, Sigal, you've been. I think part of what you've been saying is we certainly want our leaders to be trustworthy, as individuals of course we do and that's a, that's essential but i i still think that if the structure is such is that, that there's a huge imbalance of power and then relying on the trustworthiness of the individual is kind of fragile we hope that it happens but you know what's the protection in case it doesn't and i'm reminded a little bit about you know ideas of patriarchy that if you uh that if you have a gender norms in which the in which the man is you know has say over the woman and we hope that he uses it responsibly um, but there's really no protections against that and i think that uh, this is a very important point for all forms of altruism all forms of love prosociality and so on because it does make you vulnerable it is unethical to counsel any kind of pro-social behavior that makes you vulnerable unless you can provide the social environment in which that will not be exploited we sometimes call this the problem of declawing the cat. You don't take an alley cat, take out its claws, and then put it back in the alley. If you don't change the alley, then you haven't done a favor by counseling anyone to be kind or good and in any way at all. And so ultimately, I think for love, and I think this is one reason why people are skeptical about talk of love, is that if you just talk about it and you try to cajole people to do it, but you're in a social environment in which in which uh, it can be easily exploited. Well, people deserve to be skeptical about, about that. So I think that takes us back to the to the to the very, very complex trade-off. A very complex trade-off is yes, you need structure. And sometimes that structure can be flat. Sometimes it needs to be hierarchical. Sometimes you do need to invest a lot of decision-making authority in a few people, but be damn careful in how you do that and don't just rely on the trustworthiness of the individual because even if it's working right now it doesn't have to work you know and some future point of time that individual might change or there you, know, you might have a new individual and there and then where will you be so this gets us back to culture and organization yeah. in addition to the trustworthiness of the individual See, and i and i would say that 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 yes and that that at, at, which is why um when I do work with organizations, I so emphasize um, not only the culture. So yes, it takes you back to the culture. So for example, when I teach EI, um, emotional intelligence, one of the points I make, um, and, and even as it relates to culture, is that ultimately, if you want to know what a, what a group's culture is, um, organizationally, it's not what's on the wall, what's written on the wall, or on their cards, or on the website, you know, or on the elevator doors. It is the answer to what is rewarded and punished around here, because what's rewarded and punished is the is you know you can say yes we're team oriented and pro social and and we you know and then you see that the people who are getting promoted are the ones who are stomping on everybody and you know then then no being team oriented and and social is not you know what is promoted. And so I, I think you, you got to be somewhat savvy about this too. You know, not, nothing is, is just like, oh yeah, just do this. You have to be cautious in your environment. You need the culture to be supportive because I have seen cultures, for example, where people have been demoted or even fired um, or, and certainly not allowed to rise um, because they have behaved in ways that have been, you know, um, bad for other people. And, um, but if you don't have that protection, then yeah, you could really get yourself um, in trouble. And so, but, but I think I, you know, and it's funny, and again, I wonder if this is um, kind of the longer versus shorter orientation, 
But in our organizations today, the reality is that when a new leader comes in, um, and again, question at what level, you, are, you do tend to be playing with a new ball game unless you have a strong culture. And then ideally they've selected a leader who matches the values and they're going to support that. Um, and so, so yeah, it's not just a, you know, go off and do it. You have to be aware of your environment and what environment you're in. Oh, wait, I did want to say one thing before we, we, cause I know we're close to the end. Um, David, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, spirituality and Judaism and stuff. So one of my favorite things um, uh, about um, uh, Judaism, uh, by the way, one, one of the things about Judaism also is that um, Judaism doesn't try to control um, inner thoughts. So, so you can have like a really bad inner thought, but you don't have to do penance for it as long as you don't act on it. Um, uh, but, but one of my favorite things out of the Talmud is that there is a line that basically says fake it till you make it. Um, they they don't they don't use that language, but um, but basically it's like you know if you're not an honorable and good person or something like that, just just act like one, and eventually it will come to you. Um, which is kind of the one of the hearts of of this idea of the the culture piece, which is even if you're not feeling companion love or whatever, just just sort of fake it till you make it and then you will actually do it. And it's, and, and I've, I, it took me a long time to track down that phrase. A, a rabbi said it once and then I went to go look for it and I ultimately found it, but then I lost it again because I wanted to cite it in an article. <laughs> people, people don't realize how, how different Judaism and Christianity are from each other because, you know, one is historically derived from the other, but in order to adapt to its new environment and basically to expand a, a, a worldview beyond, beyond another group, um, then it required just very different symbolic system. And religious scholars actually use words like morphology <laughs> in order to be a religion that is central to Christianity and peripheral to Judaism. It begins there. So it's so interesting that, um, that there is this diversity that I, that I mentioned, which is reflected at smaller, um, at, uh, at uh, at smaller uh, scales we need to understand we need to be able to speak each other's language when I mean, the first thing we do when we enter into conversation is that we need to explore our use of key terms and become multilingual basically even when we're all speaking english or french or that kind of language and each and every and there's such diversity in this way that whenever we have a conversation and that includes especially across disciplinary conversations. When you're speaking to someone with a different, from a different discipline, you've just got to spend time exploring the meaning of key words just so that you can understand each other and to, and to create the appropriate uh, uh, translations. And ultimately, of course, that's a very respectful thing. A lot of what we're talking about ends up being, uh, I think, very hopeful and encouraging for issues such as equity that, uh, that, uh, and justice that uh, of course, are is claiming all of our attention in the current moment. And you know, to the point of keywords, I want to go back to something I know is very near and dear to Michael's heart, and I've also seen in the chat. Um, and so I, I don't want to be remiss to miss that, which is, which is the key word of love. Um, and you know, what what does love mean? Um, who's appropriated it? Who hasn't? And, um, and I, I liked one of the things, you know, it, like love has a, I, oh, Gareth, interesting, uh, that, you know, has a PR problem. And, um, and you know, I, I don't know what to tell you except for to say that um, my contribution to this, and, and, and actually I, I am really happy about, about, about this, is that my contribution is to continue to use the term, as I said, when I teach executives, when I do keynotes, clearly in my research is keeping the term of companion love. You know, one of the first things I do in any talk is like I have this, this slide actually that I got from Mandy, which has two squirrels and looking at each other very, very lovingly. And I'm like, no, it is, or one's holding a flower. No, it is not romantic love. You know, I kind of immediately get that off the table um, just from a definitional perspective. 
And then I describe what it is. I do that within like the first two minutes and usually people get it. And once they get it, I have found them to be remarkably open um, to the concept. They're like, oh, okay, yeah, I understand that. But not so being really clear about it, um, being very matter of fact about it. And my biggest contribution probably though, is doing research. The reason I have done so much um, uh, outcome research with this is to show that it matters. And we can rail against that if we want and say, why do we have to show it? And, you know, but ultimately, you know, I mean, I'm a scientist. And so I, you know, I'm not, but before I'm going off to tell people, you know, yeah, this really matters and it's great and you should be doing this. Um, and, and again, I would take David's cautions uh, very seriously about kind of in which context, but I need to be able to show that it actually matters to something. And that is the kind of work I've been doing over the past 10 years, which is, yes, this matters. And it matters in a whole variety of contexts and that you can have a better functioning organization that is more productive and your people are going to be better off. I mean, it really is a win-win-win across the board. And sort of that's my contribution to try to get out there as much as possible, creating the science and letting people know about the science. Um, and I, I, I should, you know, I've, I've been, um, I've been loath to write a book because there's just so many words in books. And, um, and uh, there's, you know, in the examples and this and that, but, but, but it, you know, per, perhaps if I was to do it, you know, maybe it should be, you know, a book, you know, about love um, as a way to get, again, get this research out there and, and um, you know, make it more legitimate in some ways for companies to... Uh -huh. Yeah, if I could, uh, we, we got to wrap up. Is that right? We, uh, we have only a few more minutes. Yeah, yeah. If I go could ahead. make a wrap up. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll make my, my wrap up statement in less than, than a minute. First of all, this has been so awesome. So thank you so much, Michael, for putting it to, um, uh, together. I want to end with a, basically a call to, um, to organize that there really is something we need to do. And, it's, and, uh, Siegel, I hope you write a book, but on the other hand, uh, uh, that's not going to be good enough. There's a lot of books out there, and then there's a lot of stuff that's out there. And I think the limiting factor, we need to actually think like cultural evolutionists and, and how we do this. I think there's a degree of cooperation among ourselves. Each one of us is doing great work, uh, including great organizational work, Michael's organization building, I do organization building, but uh, they're still so fragmented. And I think that there is like a new plateau that can be reached in terms of this paradigm, this worldview, um, becoming better organized and then spreading itself uh, 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 and uh, uh, in comparison to competing narratives and basically making the process of positive cultural evolution take place much faster than it would otherwise. This is the kind of thing that could take decades and could take years, depending upon how we go about it. The idea of catalysis, which is familiar in chemistry, also exists for culture. So there are things that we can do to speed up the rate of positive cultural evolution, even by more orders of magnitude, and we should be doing that. And that includes books plus much, much more. So I think that I'm already working with Michael on these sorts of things, and you're all doing great work but we must do it in a way that I think that combines our, our capacities um, um, and enables us to reach a, a new plateau compared to what we're, the great work that we're currently doing. And I, um, I, I you know, it's funny, which, which harkens back to your point from the very, the very beginning, you know, kind of the collective, the collective action. And, um, and, and Michael, I also really want to thank you. It is true. When you contacted me initially, I'm like, but I don't understand how this would come together. And, and since, I mean, this has been just delightful. I mean, it's so interesting and, and engaging. So, so thank you so much. And David, really, it has been such a pleasure to have the opportunity to have this conversation. Well, thank you both. Thank you, Sigal. Thank you, David, for, for joining. And, and this was really an organic kind of loving conversation with listening, sharing, and 
and building on each other. So I really want to commend you and just thank you, Sigal, for, for, for just jumping in. <laughs> and, and I think this is a call, like David was saying, also to, to see what are next steps, because we are in a time where we need more love, not the romantic, uh, simplified, stupidified one, but one where we really truly build on each other and, and recognize each other's dignity and build a uh, institution and a culture where we can all flourish. And that's been sort of becoming more and more clear. And I think we, research is important, research may be there. We know intuitively what we need to do. So this is also a call for those that wanna be connecting more. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, please let us know. Uh, there was a question, David and Sigal, if you'd be willing to share your uh, email and contacts, maybe you wanna do that through the chat. Uh, I know there are many uh, people here on the call that are working in this field, so please be in touch. We're going to pu uh, put up a follow-up uh, group to this. Uh, we have a book coming out on love and organizing, and if there are still people that want to contribute to that, maybe there is an opening there. We also have a journal where we can publish these things, the Humanistic Management Journal, and we're also ex uh, inviting explorations. And, and maybe Sigal, if you're up to it, just sort of throwing your, your head in the ring and, 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 and just uh, sharing some of your thoughts, even though they may be not uh, fully cooked yet, that'd be, that'd be great because you are a leader in this field and you can sort of guide us also in that sense. So thank you all for being here. Thank you all for participating. Thank you, Sigal. Thank you, David. And we'll continue that conversation, so stay tuned. Okay. Great, thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Thanks, Sigal, and everyone.